Hello and welcome to everyone. My name is Shirsha Shaha and uh, today I will be teaching you or rather more of discussing with you the basic principles and applications of SDS page. So in this course we are first going to begin with SDS page and then we are going to move on to the various other techniques that are commonly used in laboratories for assessing proteins and for uh, detecting protein protein interactions. So to begin with SDS page is the first topic that we'll be taking. SDS page which if we uh, expand the abbreviation stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So what is electrophoresis? The term electrophoresis comes from Greek and it generally means transport by electricity. It is a technique in which molecules are separated from one another in an electrical potential gradient on the basis of the net charge, size and shape. It involves the use of support matrices which are based essentially porous gels, for instance agarose or polyacrylamide gels, which basically act as a sieve by partially obstructing the movement of large macromolecules while allowing smaller molecules to migrate through freely. So when you're applying electrical current, it is very well known that the cathode is negatively charged. So positively charged molecules migrate towards the cathode and the anode is positively charged and negatively charged molecules migrate towards the anode. And it is this basic principle which is utilized in electrophoresis. Now the rate at which an ion will migrate toward an electrode during electrophoresis is called its electrophoretic mobility which is usually expressed in centimeter square per second volt. So depending on how big a molecule it is, a bigger the molecule, more resistance it would face when passing through any porous gel and therefore it would migrate slowly. And smaller a molecule, more easily it can make its way into the nooks and crannies of a porous gel and therefore it will migrate much more quickly. And this basic principle is utilized to separate out molecules on the basis of their size. Now electrophoretic mobility will be influenced by the net charge. Obviously how much charge a molecule has will determine with what rate it is migrating towards a particular electrode. The field strength stronger the applied current faster would be the migration charge density the molecular size and shape as well as the nature of the medium if we come to molecular size i have already explained that now coming to shape so for instance imagine a molecule which is very compact and then imagine a molecule which is much more elongated so the compact molecule because of its overall uh, less volume you could say it would face lesser resistance but Compared to that, a molecule which is more spread out, it will face more resistance and therefore migrate slowly. So the molecular shape also plays a role in determining the rate of migration or electrophoretic mobility. Now the velocity at which an ion migrates in an electrical field would be given by the product of its electrophoretic mobility and the applied voltage gradient. Electrophoresis can be of various types like native gel electrophoresis, SDS page, isoelectric focusing, 2D electrophoresis or capillary electrophoresis and uh, we will be dealing with each one of these one by one so it would clear up what each of them mean. And electrophoresis in general has wide applications in chemistry, biology as well as in molecular biology. So if we come to the components of a polyacrylamide gel, so polyacrylamide gel is what we commonly use for separating out proteins on the basis of their uh, charge or rather on the basis of their size in case of SDS page. So acrylamide is one of the key constituents or the key components of a polyacrylamide gel. It is essentially a white crystalline powder. It is bought in the form of a powder and then it is dissolved to prepare a solution. However, be careful, acrylamide monomers are very neurotoxic and therefore you should take utmost care when dealing with acrylamide. Always wear gloves and always wear mask as well because inhaling acrylamide is also poisonous. Now the acrylamide concentration of a gel can be varied. It generally extends from 5 to 20 percent. So higher the concentration of acrylamide, more dense a gel would be and this would result in smaller pore size. Smaller the pore size, more retardation would be faced by the molecules migrating through it and this would affect the resolution or the resolving power of a gel 
and what do i mean by resolution it's nothing but the ability of a gel to separate out two molecules lower percentage gels are better for resolving higher molecular weight proteins why because if we have lower percentage gels in that case the pore size would be bigger so it would be easier for higher molecular weight proteins to pass on the other hand if it was a higher percentage gel and the pore size was smaller then all of the high molecular weight proteins or all proteins above a certain molecular weight would face high resistance and therefore they cannot separate out among each others and they would just remain very close in the presence of a free radical generating system or an polymerizing agent these acrylamide monomers are hooked to one another they would be first activated and they would polymerize forming long chains and a solution of this polymer chains will become viscous but it will not form a gel because it will slide over one another so these chains form need to be hooked to one another to allow for gel formation so bis acrylamide which is the second or the next uh, constituent of a polyacrylamide gel plays a very important role in this hooking it acts as a cross linking agent for polyacrylamide gels so if you look at it this is your acrylamide molecule this is your methylene bis acrylamide molecule and over here you see this is one long polymer of acrylamide this is another polymer of acrylamide these are like long chains and bis acrylamide is acting as a bridge which is hooking these chains together allowing for gel formation and solidification of this polymer next we have sodium dodecyl sulfate sds which is a critical constituent of these gels so it is an anionic detergent anionic meaning it has a net negative charge it is a protein denaturant now what do i mean by denaturant a denaturant is any molecule which would be um how do i put it so it will denature your protein what do i mean by denature its a uh, shape would be disintegrated any protein it has a particular fold right so a denaturant would disrupt this fold and it will simply unfold the protein unfold the protein exactly So SDS also acts to mask the charge of the studied proteins and it binds at a specific ratio to the protein. So this ratio of SDS to protein is generally typically 1.4 is to 1. So as a result what happens is that your protein gets coated with a layer of SDS. So this is the structure of SDS. It has a hydrophilic water loving head and it is a long hydrophobic tail. So what happens is that when you have a folded protein you add SDS to it SDS will basically coat the entire protein it will unfold it or denature the protein and now the protein molecules will separate out simply on the basis of their size the effect of their shape is now negated because all proteins have been unfolded and the effect of their charge is also negated because SDS would be coating the protein giving it a uniform negative charge and therefore all proteins will now migrate towards the anode which is a positively charged electron so next we have APS which is ammonium persulfate which is also very important it initiates gel formation and we have TEMID which promotes polymerization however note should be taken that APS and TEMID must be added only before the gel is being cast because the moment you add APS and TEMID to your gel solution it will begin to uh, solidify so the moment you add APS and TEMID you just quickly mix it in and you pour it in between the gel plates to allow for solidification in the desired shape and the rate of polymerization and the properties of the resulting gel both depend on the concentration of APS as well as TEMID take note TEMID smells like rotten eggs so yeah be careful about that so next coming to the types of SDS page buffer systems we have two types first is a continuous buffer system what do we mean by a continuous buffering system so a continuous system has only a single separating gel and it uses the same buffer in the tanks as well as in the gel itself so we have a resolving gel why would we call it resolving gel because this is where your proteins will get resolved on the basis of their molecular weight next we have a discontinuous buffer system now in a discontinuous system there is a stacking gel which is layered on top of a separating gel so why are why is this done we will be dealing with that in much details in the coming slides but do keep this in mind that with a discontinuous gel you can obtain a much greater resolution as compared with a continuous gel system as i will shortly explain so a typical polyacrylamide gel composition looks somewhat like this it has 30% acrylamide so 
the acrylamide powder that we talked about in the beginning we prepare a 30 percent solution of the acrylamide powder which contains acrylamide as well as base acrylamide in the ratio of 29 is to 1 and we have trace buffers of two different molarities and phs uh, we have 10 percent sds 10 percent aps temid and water so these are basically the stock solutions that are used and this is the resulting volume or the final volume that we use in a resolving or stacking gel of different concentrations now a fun activity for you uh, calculate the final concentration of all the reagents in the resolving and stacking gel so keep in mind this is the stock concentration and this is the volume that you're adding so a hint to calculate what would be the final concentration is that you first find out the total volume of the resolving gel and the stacking gel mixture that you're preparing and from there you can then go ahead to calculate the final working concentration of these different reagents in your gel comp in your gel uh, it would be useful for you to know this because once you know the final working concentration you can just calculate it depending on how many gels you're casting and what would be the final volume of the gel that you'll be casting so why is a discontinuous buffer system better so the electrophoresis system of choice is typically trisglycine discontinuous SDA page. So it has a stacking gel on top. So what happens in the stacking gel? An iron gradient is formed in the early stages of electrophoresis, which promotes stacking. All regions of the gel basically contain the first or the leading ion, which is your chloride ion. And the buffer contains a slow ion. So you have already added chloride in the gel. It is present in the various constituents that you have added. And then you mean that it's present in the tris buffer, basically the tris CL buffer that you add. And the buffer contains a slow trailing ion glycine, which is also present in the tank buffer. So what happens is that when an electrical potential is applied across the stacking gel, which is a pH of 6.8, the voltage gradient causes the quickly moving chloride ions to migrate down, which forms an ion front ahead of the slower moving glycine ion. So chloride migrates much faster than glycine and this is because of its charge density and because of its size. So it migrates very quickly when a voltage gradient is applied and it forms a leading front and behind you have a slower front formed by the slower moving glycine ions, the trailing front, not slower, my mistake, the trailing front. So the steep voltage gradient beyond the chloride ion front accelerates the much slower glycine ions to keep pace because there is a sharp fall in voltage gradient because chloride ions have a very high charge density and this accelerates the slower glycine ions. Proteins possess an electrophoretic mobility that is intermediate between the two extremes. So what happens is that as the glycine and the chloride fronts are sweeping down, a narrow zone is created between these two where the proteins get concentrated. So the stacking gel has larger pores, keep in mind. So if you go back to the previous table, you would see that the concentration or the percentage of stacking gel is much lower, which allows them to have large pores so that you do not have any sieving action during the stacking event. So what happens as a result of this stacking is that all of your proteins are now starting at the same point, right? Okay, I will explain this in the later slide where there's a, a schematic representation for clearer purpose. So in the resolving gel, now once these proteins reach the resolving gel, there's a change in pH. So if you go back to the previous, uh, previous to previous slide where the table comprising of the constituents of a polyacrylamide gel was given, you would see the two different pH trace buffers were used 6.8 and 8.8 .8. the 6.8 buffer was used in the stacking gel and the 8.8 .8 pH buffer was used in the resolving gel so what happens as the pH changes from 6.8 to 8.8 .8, the degree of ionization of glycine changes and as a result of which it becomes much much greater at 8.8 .8. so now what happens the glycine ions will now overtake the protein zone and it will catch up with the trailing edge of the chloride whose mobility will remain unaffected by the change in pH because it is already at its highest level of ionization. So this new interface will then simply migrate rapidly through the rest of the gel, leaving your protein behind and the proteins are now going to get physically retarded by the smaller pores in the separating gel. As they get retarded, this will allow for their resolution and now the proteins will separate from one another on the basis of the size difference by the sieving action in the separating gel. So 
if we come to it so this is your gel we have loaded your protein samples into the wells and this is your stacking part of the gel this is the resolving part of the gel and this is your positively charged electrode which is the anode so you are not applying any current at this point when you start applying voltage or current to your gel so now your sample begins to enter into the gel from the well so you have your chloride front at the beginning and the glycine front at the back now why is having a stacking gel useful because if you did not have a stacking gel imagine that this gel was not there so when you apply a voltage so the protein molecules which are here at the bottom of the well compared to those at the top they will enter the gel first and the ones present at the top will enter the gel later now because they will be entering the gel later they will have lesser amount or they will be subject they will basically be subjected to less sieving and the ones which enter first they will have more time to pass through the gel and they'll be retarded at a different rate compared to the ones which are entering later so this would result in a differential sieving effect on the proteins entering first and the proteins entering later you might think it's what 10 20 microliters it will not make a difference but yes it makes a huge difference it will affect the resolution of the resolving power of your gel and that is why a discontinuous buffer system is much much better so now you see the samples have completely entered into the gel out of the well and it's moving ahead so at this point the moment you move from the stacking to resolving all of your protein sample has been stacked into a thin fine layer and all of them now enter into the resolving gel simultaneously so this ensures that all of them face the same extent of retardation or rather the same uh, yes extent of retardation from the resolving gel the same time duration of retardation i wouldn't say extent but rather the same time duration all of them are retarded for the same amount of time and now simply your glycine and chloride front will migrate out of the gel and your protein is resolved on the basis of their molecular weight so coming to sample preparation now it is, is it usually necessary to reduce the disulfide bridges that are present in proteins before they can adopt the random coil configuration which is required for separation by size so uh, the sample treatment should therefore solubilize and denature the proteins so denaturation involves unfolding and critical for unfolding is reduction of disulfide bridges that are linking together cysteine residues it should dissociate the polypeptide associations and complexes so denaturation also involves dissociation of a complex so if you have a quaternary structure it will simply dissociate it to give rise to the primary structure of your protein so this will allow separation of the protein simply on the basis of its size and effect of any conformation of any folding or any association is negated out and it should also reduce the disulfide bonds so to ensure that i neither of these three can affect or alter the rate of migration through the acrylamide matrix thus the sample preparation for sds page involves treatment of the sample with heat why heat it will denature your proteins and overcome tertiary protein folding a reducing agent to break or reduce these disulfide bonds sds to denature the protein subunits linearize the protein chains and to coat them with a uniform negative charge that's it so all three of these treatment is essential and as you can see we take multiple approaches to ensure that the protein is completely denatured and that the conformation of the protein has no effect on its migration through the gel so the denaturants that are typically present in gel loading dye so disulfide bonds do play a critical role in stabilizing yes uh, we have this is a uh, like a schematic showing what a typical disulfide bridge looks like and this is helping to hold this protein chain in a particular conformation these are intra chain disulfide bonds mind you because they are formed between cysteine residues that are part of the same polypeptide chain inter chain disulfide bonds would be formed between cysteine residues that are part of different polypeptide chains now reducing the disulfide bonds help in unfolding of your protein and commonly used denaturants include beta mercaptoethanol or beta me also known as 2me and dithiothreatol or dtt so this is uh, the structure of beta me and you can see how beta me is reducing this disulfide bond it's simply associating with the sulfur and you get one sulfhydryl group here and this is how it is reduced fine so this is like one molecule of beta me which is binding to uh, which is reducing one sulfhydryl group and then another molecule comes in and reduces the other one 
and this is the structure of dtt and this equation simply gives an idea of how dtt is reducing the disulfide bond present over here to give two sulfhydryl groups not linked to each other so coming to the gel loading dye so it is very important to have a gel loading dye why samples are treated with lamley's buffer which is what makes up the gel loading dye at 80 to 90 degree centigrade for 5 to 10 minutes so this 80 to 90 degree centigrade treatment will be the heat treatment that will help in denaturing your protein glycerol is typically added to weigh down the sample so that when you're loading it onto the well your sample will simply sink to the bottom of the well and it will not float and go here and there because imagine if you add a colored solution to any buffer or to water it will just go everywhere so in order to ensure that it's weighed down and it enters the well it you have to add glycerol now proteins are not visible during the run so you have to add a tracking dye for example uh, bromophenol blue is most commonly used as a tracking dye so this is what is giving it its blue color so that as your protein sample is migrating through the gel you can see how far it has migrated to allow you to know how far it is gone when do i stop the gel when do i not I mean, no one would want that you run the gel and then your entire protein sample runs out. You're not even aware of it or you run the gel and it is not at all resolved and you just stop the gel. And bromophenol blue is commonly used because it is viable in alkaline as well as neutral pH. It's a small molecule, so it will move ahead of most of the proteins and therefore it will give you a good idea. It will form a dye front much ahead of where the protein actually is. And it is ionizable and negatively charged above pH of 4.6. So that ensures that it migrates towards the anode. Now, sometimes uh, we also, not sometimes, you also have to add a molecular weight marker to the gel to uh, allow us to later identify what band corresponds to what molecular weight. And sometimes these molecular weight markers also are pre-stained. So that also gives you an idea of how more or how much more or how much less you need to resolve your gel or how resolved your gel is. So coming to staining a gel, typically we use Kumasi Brilliant Blue. This is the most commonly used uh, reagent for staining gels. It is an anionic dye and it binds to proteins non-specifically. So a usual typical staining solution contains Kumasi Brilliant Blue or CBB at 0.25 to 0.5%. In methanol, 30 to 40%. Acetic acid, 10% and water. And when you stain the gel, the entire gel gets stains, not just your protein bands, but the background also gets stained. So de-staining is very, very important. And it is typically done with a solution which basically comprises of all of these. That is methanol, acetic acid and water. You just leave out the CBB. So the proteins will be detected as blue bands on a clear background. As you can see over here, this is a really well stained gel. So over here, if you look at the molecular weight marker, the marker is not a pre-stained marker. So the marker is also getting stained. In case it was a pre-stained marker, then these bands have their own coloration and they will not take up this stain. Okay. And the better you de-stain a gel, the more contrast you will get between your bands of interest and the background. So that is always better. So you have... It is very important to estimate the molecular weight of a protein from SDS page because that was the ultimate point that you separate out the proteins and you determine the molecular weight of the protein. So the electrophoretic mobility or distance traveled by a species during SDS page is inversely proportional to the logarithm of its molecular weight. So therefore, the distance traveled is a measure of its molecular weight. More the distance is traveled, less is its molecular weight. Lesser the distance traveled, more is its molecular weight. So the migration distance of a protein can be compared with the plot of the distances migrated by a set of standard proteins to determine its molecular weight. So it is quite natural. You, uh, it's quite common actually for anything. You need a set of standards. And once you have the set of standards, you can plot it. On uh, You can plot simply the distance migrated versus the molecular weight. And from there, if you have a protein of unknown molecular weight, you know the distance migrated and you can identify the molecular weight. And the molecular weight markers are always run in a separate lane in the gel to help with this determination. So a fun activity, uh, you have a plot over here. The aim is to determine what will be the distance traveled by a um, protein of mass 35 kilodalton. And the other one would be uh, what is the molecular weight of a protein which has migrated a certain distance, in this case, 7 centimeters. So I think this is a very simple exercise and doing this will give you an idea of how actually we plot things. And if you go back to the previous slide, you can then now compare the 
size the band the distance migrated with the molecular weight marker and you can identify what is the weight of a particular band so uh, this particular link is very good for further reading it has been taken from the website of biorad which is a known uh, commercial um, i want to say website it's a a uh, company from where you can purchase all of the different reagents uh, reagents and equipments that are required for doing sda speech and i think this website or this link rather that i have embedded over here will help you clarify for the doubts that you might have and will give you a better idea uh, i will be attaching the presentation file along with the lecture so you can just go through the slides as per your um, as per your convenience and you can uh, find this link embedded so you can easily go to here so if you have any questions feel free to leave it in the comment section i will try to get back to you to the best of my abilities thank you and i will uh, catch you next time